Today on the program, chaos at NDDC probe by House of Representatives as acting MD Ponde faints during hearing. Plus, APC governorship primaries get underway in Ondo State. And later on the show, bandits ambush Nigerian soldiers in Jibia, Katina State, just as killer herdsmen attack Kukum Daji in Kaura, local government area of Kaduna State, killing 16. I'll be hanging out today with Babajide Kolade Otitoju, while Gani Kayode Balogun will join us via Skype. So let's hang out, start now. Well, indeed, a tragic comedy of sorts played out at the ongoing probe of allegations of fraud at the National Development uh, Commission, NDDC, in Abuja, where chaos was let loose. And this happened when the acting managing director of the NDDC, Professor Daniel Ponde, was being grilled by the lawmakers. And as a member of the committee, uh, Iduma Igariwe was questioning him about extra budgetary spending at the commission. Professor Ponde slumped and fainted momentarily, forcing an adjournment. Was he acting or not became a raging debate among Nigerians. Let's share that moment with you. What you are operating is the 2019 budget, which as you know and as we know ended May 31st, 2020. We are now in July, so you are not expected to be spending money from budget 2019 has expired. From where are you going to spend this money you said here on oath that you are preparing to pay students who are on scholarship? Are you aware that every expenditure you make from 31st May till date are not, uh, are not. Excuse me, MD is not feeling fine. watching journalist hangout on TVC News and we just saw highlights of uh, hearing today at the House of Representatives in Abuja uh, with questions being posed at Professor Ponde. However, he became uh, indisposed and the story goes on or the report goes on to say that the speaker Fem Bajabia Miller had said he be excused uh, that the committee work with uh, the documents he had tendered before it. BKO, welcome to the program. Justice uh, GKB is also online with, with us. Welcome to the program, gentlemen. But what do you make of what transpired today, BKO? Oh, it's shocking. It's, um, it's really shocking. And um, you know Nigerians are naturally cynical. Uh, many of them believe that what happened was just a uh, uh, Nollywood drama. They believe that this thing was just uh, contrived. Um, and you can't blame those who are thinking in this manner because this same um, MD had worked out on the committee. Last week, only so, last week. Um, meaning that he was not prepared to thoroughly surrender himself uh, for grilling. Why would you work out? These guys are mandated by the Constitution to do what they are doing. It's well within their responsibilities as lawmakers to do the oversighting that they are doing. And then you work that on them. Today again, as they were asking you a very pertinent, pertinent. question, 
relating to illegal spending after the budget cycle had ended. And then we saw what happened. I'm not a doctor, I'm not, I'm not a medic. I don't know uh, what conditions uh, must be present when someone truly slumps. Um, I don't know. I don't know. And I cannot say, like many Nigerians are saying, that it was play, play acting. Sure. But the important thing is, let the NDDC be thoroughly cleansed of the corruption that has become second nature to it. Let us defeat corruption within the NDDC because it has since become uh, a cesspool for corruption. So whatever happens, uh, whatever the chairman, I mean the MD does, the important thing is that the probe should go on and let Nigerians for once, for once, see that there is a determination to cleanse one of the most notorious cesspools of corruption in our country once and for all. We need to really And are you take impressed what's going with on. the pace? Are you are you impressed with the pace? Will we indeed uh, get to discover, you know, the, the answer or the solution now uh, to erase the corruption in, in the NDC? It depends on how determined we are to put structures in place. Because this is not simply about individuals. We've seen clearly that individuals do not on their own defeat corruption. You must put the right structures in place. Enough of simply uh, looking for uh, strong individuals, people with the mindset to not wink at corruption. Mm. It's not enough. We've seen with the EFCC, nice blokes brought into office, chairman of the EFCC, but corruption has still not been defeated. Standards. So we have also seen in the course of this probe that even an agency like the Bureau of Public Procurement that ought to be above board, that ought to be um, the agency that ensures that not only due process is followed, but ensures that corruption does not happen in the course of its own work. We've seen them come up to say they were misled. Misled by corrupt elements within the NDDC. So if such an organization if such a body can say it was misled to take certain action that in the view of the people uh, um, probing the NDDC actually allowed corruption to be actualized, then something is wrong. Right. It, it really means that there are other measures that we need to take to even check the activities of the BPP itself. So we're talking about a, an overhaul, a total, total yes, cleansing. Um, yes, that's what I'm saying. BKO, let me put you on hold and let's get um, to hear from uh, GKB, Gani uh, Kayode Balogo. So uh, Professor Ponde unfortunately couldn't, you know, give answers now to the pertinent questions uh, being asked from, um, from the committee to the NDDC. But he didn't come alone. So what were you expecting to happen? So if, if can somebody else from the team, couldn't they have provided answers? Or are you satisfied with, with the pace with which uh, the committee is going in unraveling the mysteries uh, behind the corruption in the NDC? I don't think any Nigerian is satisfied with the comedy of error that went on today at the National Assembly. There is a need to really do a forensic audit about the entire structure, not only the NDDC. It's obvious that there are certain agencies that are meant for intervention, that have become more scared by themselves. It's created basically to intervene in areas where the federal and state government cannot get to in terms of infrastructural development. And this has failed. In the last 20 years, they've become nothing more than just a public pipe for people to take money out of the system. We cannot win this fight by simply pretending that NDDC is the only successful in the system. If not for an insider that leaks, that, that blow out the essence of what they are saying. Imagine what would have happened if they all agreed together to cover up this. 
is corruption. So people need to come up forward more. The new tubular policy must be enshrined in such a way to encourage people to come forward and expose things of this nature. Imagine uh, an institution like the Bureau for Public Procurement that's supposed to be the final place for people looking for contracts. To make sure things are not play all the way around and get them misled. If you can mislead the police, they are with self. All right. Back to the studio. Okay, so last week, uh, with a, and as a follow-up of what happened last week, we've seen the chairman uh, of the committee, the S World chairman, now you know stepping down. That's Honourable uh, Olubumi stepping down uh, now. So, what happens? What happens now? Even as we, we go on, and we also see the session they had with uh, the Honourable Minister of, of Niger <coughs> Delta Affairs, uh, God's will, like have you. A lot of things were, were unravelled, uh, or could have been said to have been unravelled where it came down to the pertinent question about who uh, Mr. Apabio now seems to have, you know, usurped the powers of the NDDC, the, the agency. Yes. Is that how you see it, BKO, and, you know, were the answers con convincing enough? No, I, no doubt about it. The minister had become like the face of the NDDC, um, whereby we took over the functions of the CEO of the um, of the commission, he, he deflected by that question with a convenient um, answer that the president had delegated a power of supervision to him. That the same because when they said, "Look, even the the law establishing the NDDC does not recognize an IMC." He then said, no, that the president has the power to uh, set up the IMC. We, we, we can set up an interim as well as a permanent uh, um, committee. Uh, committee to run the affairs of the uh, organization. And then he also said, look, it's only spending um, above their own threshold that they refer to him. Right. But clearly, you could see that letters were being addressed directly to him where it is actually the accounting officer of the commission that ought, ought to, to, have to have those presented. letters. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But BK, let me, let me put you on hold. I'll get back to you in a minute. Let's uh, go on now to hear from um, Honorable Steve Erebo. He is the former uh, he former majority leader of Bielsa State House of Assembly. He's on phone. And now, Honorable, uh, thank you very much for joining us at this time. Uh, so what do you have to say surrounding or concerning the, the controversies uh, around the NDDC's operations? It appears we have lost connection. Yeah, thank you very much right. for giving Please me an opportunity to uh, narrate on what happened clearly today. It's quite unfortunate. It's quite, it's quite unfortunate. It's, it's quite unfortunate what happened today. Now, let's closely look at the act setting up that commission. You state the obvious. Now, let us also look at the essence of setting up the Ministry of Niger Delta. For crying out loud, the Ministry of Niger Delta to address infrastructural needs and basic needs of the Niger Delta region. Now, with the current Minister of Niger Delta, it clearly shows that he has deviated from the Ministry of Niger Delta, and all he's interested in now is the NDDC. In his submission before the committee today, it shows that he's obviously indicting the IMC. He's obviously indicting the IMC. In the words of Joy Nunez, it's a clear collaboration that, yes, he's not directly dealing with the funds, but in cohorts with the IMC. It is unfortunate that we have a minister for Niger Delta who is supposed to be a blue blood Niger Delta. In his own words, I want to use his own words now, that God's will Akbabio, senator, should be unbundled with the responsibility of the NDDC. He should fully function as a minister for Niger Delta, come up with clear proposals on developments of the Niger Delta, alleviate the sufferings of the Niger Delta, and not to be interested in the All affairs right. um, of Honorable Erebo, allow me to butt in, because uh, God's will, like Pabio, 
Honorable, uh, allow me to butt in. Uh, the Honorable Minister also went on to say that lack of proper super supervision is also responsible for the woes of uh, this Niger Delta agency. And he has even go um, gone on to suggest that the office of the Minister of the Niger Delta should be, you know, incorporated, so to speak, into the Presidential Monitoring Committee to correct the ills uh, identified in the agency. Is that, you know, the crux of the problem? Will it work? It's not the crux of the problem. As it were, check the records properly. They had a presidential monitoring committee outside even the board of NDDC. The president in previous administration will set up a presidential monitoring committee, pick experts. They will go all out to, you know, check most of the projects that are carried out and make sure that the funds that are voted to the NDDC are properly managed and funding the right projects. At the time, we had duplication of function. Most of the projects that were carried out by the state government, NDDC in turn is carrying out such projects. Most of the projects that NDDC has done somehow, some state governors are owning up to such projects. There is no way you would say except the minister or the ministry of Niger Delta is incorporated into a project monitoring fund that will bring about a proper management of funds or whatever. That is totally a lie. The minister stands alone. You are appointed as a minister for Niger Delta. Honorable Steve Erebel, thank you very much for making your position, you know, clear and, you know, stating them to us. I'm afraid we have to, you know, move on to hear other angles. Let's go back to Ghani, Kayo de Balogo now to hear, to hear further more on his, uh, you know, take on this, this raging controversy. Well, the president has, you know, also spoken uh, on the issue and has called for, you know, expedited process in unraveling uh, all this diverse problems. With the pace the committee is, is you know, taking in its investigation, will we get it? BKO, what do you have to say about that? Well, there's a non joy Nunye angle. You know, there's so, so many chapters now in, in, in the whole corruption. The, the IMC is also there. Will we get the quick uh, delivery now from the committee? We, 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 we can't say. We just have to wait um, and see what they come up with. But um, I'm happy with what transpired today in a way. They had lied against the, the chairman of that committee. They claimed that he too had routinely collected contracts from um, the NDDC. And now he and stepped aside. Now the man decided to step aside. He had been advised to step aside, you know. And then he stepped aside today. But Akpabio was made to hit his words because you claim that he got a contract in April 2019 as chairman of the of the uh, House of Rights Committee on the NDDC. Whereas this man became chairman of that um, committee yes, yeah. in November. He's a first time lawmaker. If he was a maybe two-time, three-time lawmaker, I probably would believe them. But he had not even been there long enough. So if he, if he, if he was appointed chairman in November, and you are claiming that he received a contract in his capacity as chairman in April, do people do that? He cannot, that's, it, just, it does not add up. And then when they asked him that question, you can see that he stuttered. And uh, uh, later on, he said, oh, I don't think that he could have uh, uh, collected contract yes, at, at that time because he was not even a lawmaker at that, at time. that time. At that time, because they were, uh, the election was uh, 2015, and they were inaugurated in June. So he was not even a lawmaker at the time. But, but so quickly, the thing is, when you want to fight corruption, mm -hmm. corruption will fight back. You can see Joy saying that even Senator uh, Ngoboshi, that they told her to indict the senator and accuse the senator of receiving all kinds of contracts. So these people will fight back when you want to fight corruption. But we wait to see the, the report. And we yeah. expect that the president, who has told everyone that he hates corruption so much, who said corruption will destroy Nigeria or kill Nigeria if we do not kill it, we want to see how he responds to this uh, 
show of shame. In the, that, that, in the, that we see. I wanted you to finish to, to finish that point, uh, BKO, and then you know talk about you know the the, the revelation of um, the NDDC Act. How does it you know empower uh, the the Minister of of, of Nigeria Affairs? I, but I'm afraid we run out of time. I will, well, originally but, it was the the power to supervise that ministry was vested in the on. president. You know, mm -hmm. not the minister. So when Akwabe was made the minister. We, on this program, we criticized the idea. We said, Mr. President, this is now your job. That, okay. Don't delegate it to the Minister of Niger Data. But we have seen with what is going on in that place that it was a wrong move. You cannot say that you are supervising and some of this corruption, even illegal spendings were still going on at the time when the probe had begun. They were still taking money out. So what are you supervising? I mean, it's not enough to just simply come and speak English to people. Because some of these facts are, are clearly in the open. They are still taking out money even when well, the before. National Assembly had begun to probe the activities. All right. We'll continue to monitor and, you know, bring uh, to our viewers, you know, how far the, the House or the National Assembly is going in this uh, bid. very much for staying with us on journalist hangout so the die is cast and the battle line drawn within the all progressives congress in Ondo state as about 10 gladiators are jostling for the apc ticket to fly the flag of the party in the october the 10th governorship election now this after two other aspirants stepped down according to the apc publicity secretary in the state alex kalejai more than 2500 delegates are saddled with the responsibility of electing a governorship candidate for the party. That's where we are headed now. Uh, let's go online now to GKB. So how do you view the process? Uh, so far about four people, now four men, have stepped down for the incumbent governor, Akira Dolu, to you know, pursue his ambition for a second term. Uh, what do you make of that? Does it you know, better his chances? Uh, of course, the moment that they agree to do a indirect primary, it gives the governor an enormous advantage over his rival. Don't forget that most of the delegates uh, will be known by the governor, and most of them are brought from the local government area, which is different from the one that they do direct primaries that everybody in every world will have to play a part. So the moment the party agrees to and in direct primary, it's obvious that the governor has an enormous advantage in getting the ticket to become the governor of those states for the second time. GKB, all right, so let's go to our uh, Ondo State now. Uh, correspondent, uh, are your Dele Ozubaku is live for us now. Uh, let's hear from him to know how the process is going. The party says it's, it's an indirect you know, process to, to choose the flag bearer for the party. We'll get back to Ayodele, Ayodeji in, in a moment. But, but back here uh, in the studio, BKO, we cannot forget or you know, ignore the bickering, so to speak, now from some other aspirants who are, yeah. who are not satisfied with the process that the party has, has chosen. If, if, if I may quote Isaac Kekemeke, he said that the party shouldn't make it seem like they need members, or, or members need the party to survive. Rather, it's the other way around. The party needs members to survive. But we've seen Mr. Y Governor Yahya Bello, you know, going on uh, with the, 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 the format indirect. Yes, um, clearly, Kekemeke and um, uh, other aspirants, uh, Lucia Laoke, the rest of them, were not expecting um, that the party who go for indirect um, primaries. Um, the decision is supposed to be agreed upon with the contestants. Um, it shouldn't just be a decision taken by a few. That is the argument. And um, they felt that if it was down to direct primaries, that they are chances will be 
better served. Uh, but you know, when it is in direct primaries, the person with considerable means, the candidate or the um, aspirant with um, deep pockets usually carries the day. And with the governor um, amongst the con uh, contestants, you can be certain that he will win any indirect primaries 100 times out of 100. The governor will win um, indirect primaries because at the end of the day, even some of the contestants will not even know who the delegates are. The governor will know the you advantage. To be a direct yes, the advantage of um, indirect primaries is that you there are not so many people sure. uh, voting, so you can reach um, all of those people quickly, and then be guaranteed of victory. But that is if you control the levers of power within the party in that state. The governor, for example, has the leadership of the party in the state on his side. Mm -hmm. So there is no way, and this process is driven by them, mm -hmm. there is no way that other people will expect that they will defeat the governor mm -hmm. in an indirect primary. It's, it, in, given the kind of politics that we play, the structure of politics here, it's, 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 it's a long shot. It's, in my view, it's even impossible. Right. So that is why we are seeing uh, what we are seeing. And they are Absolutely. complaining. They thought that it would be direct primaries, whereby it would be for all comers, all members of the party can, could, uh, can vote. Okay, still on this this part that we are discussing now, is that a fair response, you know, coming from the side of Governor Yaya, who is, you know, chairing the process? Of course, uh, to the... To those aspirants, it, it can be a fair response. Um, that is not the mode for primaries that they favored. That is not the mode for primaries that um, they were convinced um, would let them win. But for the Akredolu camp, this is um, enough reason to be optimistic that the governor will coast to victory by a huge landslide. Well, the aggrieved aspirants are also saying they only just got the list of, you know, the, the delegates, which they say is, is rather unfair on their part. Yeah, it happens. It happens. I, um, for me, I've always preferred the direct primary uh, model because it gives greater power to the greater number of party members, I mean, registered party True. members. At every level, you'll be able to vote at your ward level. But in the case of uh, indirect primary, just a few people representing everyone, you know. So uh, it's not as representative as indirect, I mean, as direct primaries. But this, there is room one. for it in the Constitution. Yeah, but even the three, 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 uh, three means of conduct primaries are agreed. Direct, indirect, and of course, consensus. You know, so they can choose uh, which one, but to agree to consensus, the parties must all put heads together and say, this is where we are going. Right. Where you are unable to, uh, to agree, then you take it then, to the... Then you opt for either direct, direct or indirect. Or, right. As he said, the party reserves the right to decide what mode of primaries to follow. But it is also important to consult so that everyone feels... Um, happy about right. the decision taken. Before we lose um, Ayodeji uh, Ozubaku, Ayodele Ozubaku's connection, uh, he's live for us, our senior political correspondent, you know, covering uh, the process. So Ayodele, indirect it is now, uh, going, uh, looking at the primaries, the APC. So how is it going? Your plights. Ayodele Jumurayadi and Ayodele Ozubaku. <laughs> we are both in the same absolutely. location. Absolutely, absolutely. Good to it's, hear from uh, you, Ayodele. Over there. to you. And um, I think they are on the fourth local government. And the last local government was Iri, the local government. It's a one very growing exercise as in the process. Um, they had to, they started about 2 p.m. They didn't start in good time. They started 2 p.m. 
just imagine 3,000 um, delegates, over 3,000 delegates, 2 p.m. They started the accreditation. What was proposed before was that they had designated venues. As early as 8 a.m., they'll go to those venues for the accreditation according to the senatorial district. But well, I think the chairman of the organizing committee, that's the governor of um, Kogi State, Governor Yaya Bello, actually uh, remodeled that and said everybody should come to the dome. So that will put pressure to the dome. So the process of accreditation inside this dome, within the same complex, is somewhere outside there. So one by one, they will proceed into the dome, they screen them local government by local government, and this is like the third, I mean, the fourth local government right now. The last one I had was in the local government. So, but this is like the execution place. This is like the final slot. By the time you are um, by the time you are accredited, you move to this place, and you can see people coming here to collect their ballot paper. And once they collect their ballot paper, they cast their votes. Then they have twelve people on that ballot paper. They cast their votes, and um, you will show them the accreditation list and that drops immediately into whoever you want to vote for and what they are doing here is like an open secret ballot system open secret ballot system take your paper here go into that enclave vote vote for whoever you want and after it's like a seamless exercise and by the time you drop whatever you the uh, ballot paper you drop it here and after they will collect your accreditation um, pass. So there's a pass that allows you to come inside the air. Your accreditation pass will be collected and you move out. And as you're moving out, security people, they're escorting you. And it's very, very laughable to know that for all the delegates are 3,000, the security men we have for this exercise, there are over 9,000 security men. So you can look at the uh, ratio of delegates to security men. It's alarming. So our election is as seamless as anything. We are not going to get it right. It's as if this place is like a military enclave. Before you can make your way into this dome, the, the number of checks you will pass, the number of scrutiny you will pass, it is alarming. It is, um, for me, now, it's you? kind of ridiculous. Look at that ratio. Yes. 3,000 delegates hey, we're, to we're, 9,000. We are always militarizing our elections, are you? We are always militarizing our elections. Even, to, to um, even the primary, even the primary elections will militarize. But the question I want to ask you, yes, the question now is, the people, there are some aspirants who already are not happy, who believe that this whole thing is meant to ensure that Governor Akre Dolu carries the day. What is, how are they feeling now? Are they going ahead with the contest? And what implications can this have for the larger election? Yes. Today, this will give you an idea of what is happening. Look at these seats. This seat behind here is for the aspirants. The seat behind here is just for the aspirants. And they've counted the number of aspirants that will be seated there. And from the, what I can spot here, I can just see Chief Olu Sholaoke and one other aspirant seated. The rest came in earlier. But... Earlier today, Sholai G, um, Isaac Ekemeke, they told me that they've lost confidence in this exercise. That because it is in direct primaries, that it's like it has been determined that 11 of them actually wrote to the caretaker committee and they told them that, look, we want direct primaries. We want the people, the carrying members of um, the All Progressive Congress in on those states here to participate across the team local government. That's all the aspirants, except the, the, except the governor. Mm. That's Governor Luan Rutz in Akere Dolu. Mm. So that request was not uh, granted them. And as of Friday, Governor Yabilo announced that it's going to be indirect primaries. And some of them said, look, the way it has been skewed, they said they got the delegate list 11.45 yesterday night. So that's like close to midnight. Mm. And they, don't, they didn't mm. have time to I don't want to reach them. Mm -hmm. But some other people said, no, nothing has changed in that list. But some people will say, it's their entitlement to have that delegate list well ahead of time, so that they can study it, they can look at the dead delegates, they can look at the padded delegates, people that are not meant to be on that list. They can look how to fish it out. So time for complaints, sir. So what we are having here is that most of those aspirants, they've lost 
you know, they right. doesn't, they've lost uh, interest in this. Ayo, Ayo, Ayo. That, is, I, that is a question that I want to ask. Ayo. Ayo, are, are, are these people saying, are they saying that if it was direct primaries, they would have defeated the incumbent governor? Do they really fancy their chances of win, <laughs> winning? Politicians, the way they do their things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, somebody like Olusola, okay, somebody like Olusola, okay, will tell you that he fancies his chances of winning. That he stands a lot of chances that he is popular among his people. That is carrying members. Don't forget that the process of choosing delegates, you have to go to um, a lot of uh, what, what level? people will call statutory delegates. Those statutory delegates, the House of Assembly members, former uh, governors, and some other people that mm. they know that the, the governor would have even accounted for one third of that delegate. Yes, yes. Those are the statutory delegates. But if it's thrown open, People like Olusha Ibrahim that withdrew the his uh, to, uh, uh, or rather earlier support. today, he said he's, he has withdrawn from the race to support Governor Oluwaro okay, And But Olusha Lauke is still sticking his gun, he's still here, he's still watching, but he is <laughs> saying that, look, this is a subversion of the constitution of the APC. What mm -hmm. he meant by that, I don't know. He's a senior advocate of Nigeria. Maybe he will break it down after this exercise. But he's still seated, he's still waiting for the outcome of this exercise. All right, yeah. Ayodele, it, it probably it looks like it's going to be a long uh, you know, evening or night no, for, night, for night. you. <laughs> Four out of 18 <laughs> lo local governments. Uh, it, start absolutely, 3,000. But then it's Ayodele stuff, so uh, I'm sure I'm sure he will he will be at home in in Ondo State. Yeah. So Shego Abraham, you know, gave his support or has given his support now to the incumbent uh, g governor. But there's also been you know the attention on the cracks in the in the party mm -hmm. in in Ondo State. Talking about the faction, uh, first we first we heard that the faction had given its its uh, mandate, so so to speak, to uh, Mr. Olusholaoke. But now the party went on to say, no, that is not the position. Let's see how all the aspirants will, will slug it out, you know, today. So mm -hmm. how should you know Governor Akira Dolu now, you know, as a key aspirant in the, in the race, how should he, you know? go about it. Some have said that the challenge might even be, or the main battle might even be within the party rather than outside, you know, as he, you know, seeks their support. Yeah, the, uh, we've said it before in this program that um, the governor needs to reach out to aggrieved parties uh, within, I mean, aggrieved members within the party. That is the biggest challenge that he has. He's going to win these primaries, he's going to win easily. But that's not where the battle ends. The big battle is the main election in October. So he has to reach out, ensure that everybody is uh, on the side of the party. If he's unable to do that, the battle will be really, really tough for him. So he knows that after these primaries, he has to bring the people together. He has to talk to them. He has to get them on his side so that he can win the, uh, he can be re-elected. All right, okay, so we'll continue to see how that pans out uh, over there in Akure, the Ondo State capital. Uh, then we have to move on to yet another, you know, troubling issue where another ambush and another losses uh, for the Nigerian troops in the war against banditry in the Northwest. On Saturday alone, armed bandits ambushed troops of the Nigerian army leading to the deaths of several soldiers. The troops were parading on foot in Shimfida, Jibia, local government area of Katina State. Blood also flowed on Sunday when some gunmen suspected to be killer herdsmen gate crashed into a wedding party in Kukumdaji, village of Kaura, local government area of Kaduna State, and this occurred around 10 p.m. The gunmen killed 21 people, injured 28 others, as well as abducted a policewoman, her daughter, and four others during the raid. GKB what do you make of that? Uh, at a point uh, today, the president was even said to be meeting with the chief of army staff, Tukuburote, uh, to, uh, most people said it was obviously about, you know, the security situation that continues to be uh, rather tense in the Northwest. GKB. This is degenerating at the faster level than we assumed. A few months ago, when the Nigerian president said that he flattered out Boko Haram, we thought all we had to do was to mop up the remnants, and then we'll have peace. And I said that was a misplaced optimism. 
Because you don't think to be getting anything out of our soldiers except for death in the last few weeks. I think there is a need. And we said it on this program multiple times. For us to change the direction of where the army is continuing this war. We keep doing the same thing and we expect different results. And you and I know that there's no way to do the same thing over and over again and get a different result. That's what they call lunacy. There is a need to really, really look for other ways to solve this problem. The government have tried. They tried to negotiate with the bandits and the, and the insurgents. But so far, that seems not to be working. Because it seems to embolden them to do more damage to the other people in these states. The answer to this question is obvious. Let us change those who are responsible for this fight and give other people a chance to also try their mental and see that we are the one they can succeed. The current team has said there's no other way to look at it. And the other we have said that reality the better. And about the lack of synergy now that, that has been established as one of the, the root causes of, of this, lingering, uh, this lingering fight now against insurgency, against banditry, uh, how, how do we, you know, harness this synergy and, and make it better than it is? In the failure of leadership, there's no way people report to the same man through different channels cannot cooperate and form a synergy to fight this battle. It's basically a failure of leadership. There are not two ways to say it. Because if one arm that is fighting is not competing with the other arm, they'll be just moving around the cross property. So the earlier they realize the fact that this needs to be done differently. I keep happy on that point. We've been doing the same thing for the last five years. Not you change strategies in the last ten years. It is not working. People are dying. We are doing right, back to the studio. Uh... Okay, ca carry on, carry on, Mr. Uh, Gadi. Okay, back to the studio, uh, BKO. So uh, synergy needs to be harnessed, you know, and, and some other areas. But th these are rather, you know, deadly, uh, you know, attacks now. Katsina, Kaduna, and and all of that. The president has also spoken on it. Uh, uh, CAS Borote has also, you know, you know, talked about it that the fight is still ongoing. How do we gain progress? How do we move forward? I think that uh, there are many areas that we need to look at. Why are bandits now killing soldiers? Because I, I find this embarrassing. If it was Boko Haram, yes, I could be unsurprised because I know the capacity that Boko Haram has. I know that a lot of their fighters, they actually have training because they are mercenaries from Mali, and uh, even from uh, from Chad, former rebel fighters in Chad. So they will have some level of capability. But if bandits can down, then ambush our soldiers and kill our soldiers the way they have done, hmm. then it's something to worry about. Exactly. They've been killing civilians in Casina in a manner that is really, really shocking. We've not been able to address the problem and keep our people safe. Our people now go into Niger Republic to, to sleep. To sleep. Mm. Our people now even invite soldiers from uh, Niger Republic. People in Zurumi, in in uh, in, um, in Zamfara, and Jibia in Kasina. They now invite uh, Nigerian soldiers to come and save them. Sometimes when bandits attack their communities, it's so bad. How are the mighty falling? That was the language, uh, that was the phrase that emanated from the president's mouth when he took over. But one can say that again now. We are like a falling giant. Our people are being killed. It's like a uh, loss of life means nothing in our country anymore. You can imagine the number of people killed in that uh, uh, town, uh, Kukumdaji in the uh, uh, Kaura local government of Kaduna. People get killed, wasted in Kaduna, Kaduna State as if they are fouls. It has to stop. The president must rejig their security structure. People have said this repeatedly, but this president is reluctant to do anything about it. He has to do something about it. He's, the president is losing support on account of the fact that more and more Nigerians have been killed. And if he does not take a drastic action, 
by looking at the heads of some of these security uh, agencies and take an action against them. People will think that the president is not protecting them or is not doing enough to protect them. And it will affect him. It will affect the way Nigerians see him. Nigerians expect the president to protect them better. But that's not what we are seeing. To even, even the people should protect or the soldiers absolutely. are being wasted. To even, you know, you know, give, you know, a, a better picture now to what you just shared uh, with us on this subject. Let's also hear, uh, you know, from the villagers of Kukundaji about their experience uh, with the attackers. <laughs> Of course, uh, obvious morning there, you know, from residents of Kukub Daji village of Kaura, local government area of uh, Kaduna State. Another perspective to the spate of attacks of this nature is that the attackers are foreigners. There's also been said, BKO, that where are the vigilantes? They know the nooks and crannies of, of, this, of this the, area. These people come by far better armed than the vigilantes. You can imagine if bandits can slaughter soldiers. Who, what, what kind of gun do the vigilantes carry? Some of the bloodiest attacks that we've witnessed on communities that we've witnessed, especially in Zamfara, were in retaliation of, of uh, uh, vigilantes' efforts to, to, to uh, apprehend them. It's okay, like obviously. Stronger. Oh, well, yes, they came on a market day. They came on a market day in uh, uh, Zafala and slaughtered more than 100 people in retaliation for the attack on them by vigilantes. It's like they stormed a community and then the vigilantes uh, resisted them, killed some of them. They then came fully armed, some of them carrying rocket propelled grenades. What are you going to do as a vigilante when somebody is approaching you with a rocket propelled grenade? Grenades are tank busters. They are meant to destroy armor tanks. And then you fire directly at human beings. Who is that vigilante who can, who can stand, stand, stand up to that? Mm -hmm. This is the thing. It is the military that has to stand up and protect our people. But so on what we are seeing now is even disrespectful. These guys are behaving like they do not fear our soldiers anymore. So we have to show them that these actions will no longer be tolerated. We must show no mercy to these people because they are not even human beings in the real sense. And they are not Nigerians. A lot of these people are not Nigerians. I've seen some of them arrested. They could not speak a word of Nigerian language. So why, why should people who are not Nigerians come into our country and be killing our people? You see them when they catch some of them who are kidnappers and they are being interviewed. They can't speak our language. So we should be really merciless in dealing with yes. these people. Right. All right. Before I get to GKB, uh, let's bring in Jonathan, uh, who is a resident in Kaduna State. Thank you very much for joining us at this time. Please talk to us. Hello? You're live, Jonathan. Please speak. Yes. Well, the, 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 the mass burial took place today of the 18 people that were killed again in uh, a community called uh, Kukum Gida, I mean Kukum Daji, mm. in Kaura local government area of Kaduna State. And it is just another massacre too many that has been raging across the local governments in southern Kaduna. Mm. In fact, it has been Chukun local government uh, where several communities have been displaced, several killed, and many kidnapped, ransom paid. A lot of them right now are in the rain. They cannot go to their farms. The same thing with Kaduru local government, where several communities are also displaced. And uh, just last week, it was Zangoketa local government, where 22 people were killed 
and the communities were displaced, they are still in IDP camps. Hmm. Then just yesterday, early morning hours, the same invaders invaded this community where they got, uh, where they, they found uh, a, a, this youth. You know, one of them got married, and they, they were just doing the pre, I mean, the post uh, wedding dance inside the house, not that they went outside, inside the compound. And then these attackers again went and opened fire. Mm. And then right. 15 died, and uh, uh, the 32 were taken to the hospital, but All 22 right. were critically injured. But I'm afraid, Jonathan Asake, we, we have run out of time, but please accept our condolences on this uh, rather sad day attacks on your people. And thank you very much for talking to us, uh, telling us more about the attacks. Uh, Jonathan Asake there, the president of uh, the Southern Kaduna uh, Union there. I also must thank Jonathan uh, uh, Ike O'Hare, Bajide Koladeo Tutoju, for your contributions, valuable you. ones, well, on the program. And Gani Kayode Balogo, thank you very much for hanging out uh, despite the hitches uh, we got online. That's John's Hangout today. Don't forget to join us again tomorrow for another episode of the program. You can also watch John's Hangout on other platforms.